I thought it'd be fun to welcome our CBS Sports Radio legal analyst, Amy Dash. She was with us on the show before the judge ruled in the Ezekiel Elliott case and gave the Cowboys running back a temporary restraining order that put his suspension on hold. So I wanted to pick her brain a little bit about what happens now. So we're really pleased to welcome Amy back to the show. Uh, She does gobs and gobs and gobs of reading (laughs) and has the expertise of being an attorney. So Amy, let's start there. What is the NFL's response now that Elliott has won his restraining order and is one that stay in court? Oh, okay. So in typical NFL fashion, they have run to appeal right away, and they're asking for an expedited appeal. The problem is they had to go back to the same judge that issued the injunction and ask him to put a hold on his own order, which never happens. So they basically threatened that if he doesn't stop his own order, they're going to go to the Court of Appeals right away. And the judge responded that he wants to hear what the other side has to say. So um, they're going to file their appeal Wednesday at 5 o'clock. And the appeal for the NFL is based on what, Amy? Uh, Basically, they're saying that the judge messed up, that the judge abused his discretion and improperly Uh, applied the law to the situation, and they didn't feel that Ezekiel Elliott should have gotten that uh, uh, permanent injunction, which could potentially put things on hold for months, even years. And so what they're saying is that it's going to harm them, the NFL. It's going to harm them because they have an interest, number one, in suspending players they, they believe were involved in domestic abuse. And number two, they've collectively bargained for the right to oversee these arbitrations and make these decisions without court intervention. And there have been other cases, they said, namely Brady, that stand for the fact that courts should not get involved unless there's an egregious circumstance and in very narrow circumstances should they ever intervene in these types of awards. We had you on the show before the judge granted the temporary restraining order, and you talked about how difficult it was to meet the standard of irreparable harm. What window then did the judge find to be able to grant the stay of Elliott's suspension? Yeah, I was shocked because, first of all, like you said, you have to find irreparable harm, which is a very high standard because if money can fix it, and usually they they say that if somebody could miss games, money could fix it. And if money could fix it, they're not supposed to grant it. But also, I thought the odds were against him because he filed for this even before the arbitrator made a decision. Like I said, the courts don't even want to get involved after the arbitration has been finalized. So to interfere in a collectively bargained for process before it's even finished is unheard of. So what happened here is that the judge really bought into Ezekiel Elliott's theory that the NFL basically had a conspiracy, that they were trying to hide evidence from one of the lead investigators who didn't think that there should have been suspension. And once he bought into that, the judge, he went looking for an exception, and he found an exception in the law that let him hear this case before the arbitration was complete. And the exception basically was that um, if the NFL does something that amounts to conduct that shows that they're basically abandoning their own remedy, their own arbitration, and he thought that them trying to hide, hide evidence was like them violating their own CBA. So he decided that he could rule on it. So that was first. And then he had to decide, was there irreparable harm? And he decided yes. And the reason is because he said that Ezekiel Elliott, by missing games, he would be losing out on his ability to have professional achievements. Um, Last year, he was a leader in, in rushing. So this year, if he missed games, he may not be able to keep that title. He may not qualify for the Pro Bowl. So there are certain successes reputational achievements that the judge felt that he would never be able to get back if he didn't put a hold on the suspension. We're spending a few minutes with Amy Dash, our CBS Sports Radio legal analyst. It's After Hours with Amy Lawrence on CBS Sports Radio. So, Amy, since the suspension was put on hold, I've heard from Cowboys fans, I'm sure you have too, see Ezekiel Elliott is innocent. Uh, Even Elliott said after his Sunday night game against the Giants that he looks forward to proving his innocence. Except 
at this point, it's more about what happened in the appeals process and how the NFL handled this case than it actually is about whether or not Elliot committed domestic violence against his ex-girlfriend. Will any of the merits of the NFL's case actually come up in court? No, and that's the really unfortunate part is that you're exactly right. This has nothing to do with whether he committed domestic abuse or not. We will never find out unless more evidence surfaces. The judge will never answer that question about whether he thinks Ezekiel Elliott did the things he was accused of. All that the judge is looking at is, was the NFL's arbitration process fair? And interestingly enough, when he granted the preliminary injunction, he didn't have to rule on the ultimate question. He's got time to decide the ultimate question, which is, should he overturn the whole arbitration award, the entire suspension? But he decided to basically put his answer into the preliminary injunction. And he said, the ultimate question for me to answer is, should I overturn the arbitration award? And the, the only way I can do it is if the process was fundamentally unfair. And I think it was. So he's already told us how he's going to rule on whether to overturn the whole thing. And it sounds like it's going to be in Ezekiel Elliott's favor. So what is the timetable then for that next ruling by this judge? Uh, well, you know, they've filed for an expedited process. It seems like he is going along with that. He said that the NFL has to re- NFLPA has to respond uh, by Wednesday, 5 o'clock, and then the NFL will respond again by Friday. I think he'll have a decision probably next week about whether he's going to overturn his own order, which he's not going to do. And then they'll have to go to the Court of Appeals and They've heard cases within a matter of days. Sometimes it takes them months. So we really have no clue about when they'll hear it and when when they'll decide. It could be at the end of the season or it could be before. You know, it really strikes me that as much as the NFL is trying to establish a new precedent of cracking down harder when it comes to domestic violence and behavioral issues, they've almost cut off their nose to spite their faces and it continues to come back to bite them in the butt because the process, whether intentional conspiracy, whether intentionally hiding evidence or whether just sloppiness and, and not going by the book, Amy, the NFL is hurting itself to the point where even when it's trying to do the right thing, it still ends up in this legal battle and this chance that it could lose and, and the suspension could be thrown out completely. Yeah, and it's a shame because they have all the power. They are allowed to make any decision they want based on basically anything they want, as long as there's some sort of evidence there to justify it. So there was no need to try to hide things. There was no need to not let people testify during the arbitration. They wouldn't let Tiffany Thompson testify. The arbitrator said she uh, couldn't. She obviously was the accuser, so a very necessary party. He didn't want Roger Goodell to testify. He didn't want to go give over the investigator notes to the NFLPA. So because of that, the judge said that this arbitrator, Harold Henderson, really committed some very serious misconduct. And there was no need for it because as long as they follow the process and the process is fair, the courts aren't going to touch it. They're only looking at process here. So they can make any decision they want, any suspension they want, and it can be upheld by any arbitrator that Roger Goodell chooses. Just make it at least seem like the process is fair. And yet somehow they still manage to screw it up. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's unbelievable. (laughs) It really is. Uh, And yet here we are again, similar to the Tom Brady situation, where we're getting a peek behind the curtain, and the NFL is using all of these very strange and not... uh, not conventional, unnecessary methods when, as you talk about, they've already got the power handed to them in the collective bargaining agreement. It's just, it's, what a tangled web. We're spending a couple of minutes with Amy Dash, our CBS Sports Radio legal analyst. There's another big legal story from the sports world. Uh, Amy, it happened last winter that Charles Oakley, a longtime Nick and a beloved Nick, was removed from Madison Square Garden and he and James Dolan got into a war of words and there's a a history there, obviously. He ended up having to plead and his charges were reduced and then eventually thrown out by a judge if he would follow a, you know, a specific list of requirements and keep his nose clean and all of that jazz. But now, in retaliation, 
Oakley has filed his own lawsuit against James Dolan and the Knicks. What did it say? Uh, Basically, he's accusing Dolan of defaming him, slandering his name and reputation, and accusing the security staff at Madison Square Garden of assaulting him, assault and battery, falsely imprisoning him, and basically discriminating against him under um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, I, you know, you brought up the video, and I was a huge Knicks fan growing up. I still am to this day, but there was no group like the 90s Knicks, and Charles Oakley was a part of that. So it was actually very traumatic for me to see that all go down when I grew up as a young girl watching the Knicks and loving Charles Oakley, and it was really a very um, heartwarming and enthusiastic portion of my childhood. So to watch that, it kind of like ruined all the nostalgia that I had carried with me through the years. I'm like, Oakley, please don't do that to Oakley, you know? And I can be impartial here because I'm a lawyer, but just also I see it from a fan's perspective. Well, putting on your lawyer's hat and using your lawyer's brain, Amy, does he have a case according to the legal standard? He has a great case on, with the defamation. Um, he has a weaker case with the assault and battery claims and the false imprisonment and all that other stuff. Um, basically, when you're accusing somebody of defaming you and your reputation, they have to publish a statement about you or broadcast a statement about you that's not true. And if you're a celebrity, there's an even higher bar. They have to publish a statement that's not true, and they have to know it's not true and publish it with with bad intent, with malice, it's called, that they're looking to intentionally hurt you or damage your reputation. They have some sort of motive. So that's what he's saying. He's saying that James Dolan had an orchestrated campaign to basically destroy his reputation and drag his name through the mud. And he did this by going on the Michael K. Show, a radio program on ESPN, and basically saying that he, that Charles Oakley is physically and verbally abusive and that he's maybe an alcoholic. And so Charles Oakley, and then there were other statements. There were like tweets from Madison Square Garden that were sent out saying that Charles Oakley should get help and things like that. So It was an ongoing thing that Oakley is saying was a campaign that was intentional, that was malicious, and it was to destroy his reputation. And it's interesting because the complaint is, it's almost like a story. I mean, it just starts out with describing how revered Oakley was, how he was arguably one of the greatest power forwards in the franchise history. And just talking about all of his accolades, you know, his offensive and defensive rebounding and how incredibly loved he was by the Knicks. And then it goes into James Dolan and basically paints him as just like a trust fund baby that comes into the picture and has some sort of a grudge towards Oakley. And Oakley has no clue why. Unless I am misinformed, truth is a defense against a defamation lawsuit. So if there's anything that James Dolan said that wasn't true, how can that be proven? So they would have to prove that, yeah, he, it's, a, it's a defense. So he would have to prove that Charles Oakley is an alcoholic or that he was physically and verbally abusive. Now, uh, James Dolan said maybe an alcoholic. So he can kind of do a play on words there. And he can also try to say, well, this was just my opinion. I wasn't publishing a fact. I wasn't putting it out there as absolutely true. I was just speaking that I think maybe he has a problem because, you know, James Dolan very publicly talk, has talked about his own struggles with alcohol in the past. Um, so he can make that statement. And he can also say that there was nothing malicious or intentional about it. And because, like I said, there's that extra layer where they have to prove that there was some sort of malice behind it. But Charles Oakley is saying that this man has had a grudge against him for a while. He used to not make eye contact with him when he saw him. He wouldn't shake his hand. Uh, Charles Oakley had to buy his own tickets to the Garden to see the games. And meanwhile, he says that the Knicks franchise was having all of these legend appreciation days with former Knicks that were less successful than him, and they never showed him any type of uh, any type of appreciation. So, Well, Amy, what about the video? The video that shows him being hauled out of Madison Square Garden uh, by security guards and, and him getting rough with some of them. How does that play into all of this? 
Yeah, and that's why he has a weaker claim with the whole assault and battery thing and the false imprisonment and all that. Basically, what he's saying is, in the complaint, he literally says that he was doing nothing, absolutely nothing but sitting there when all of a sudden these MSG security guards came up and tried to remove him. I mean, there are a lot of people who say that he was heckling Dolan. There are a lot of people who think that he could have been uh, drinking To what extent, no one knows, or if he was, no one knows for sure. But um, when you go into an arena, you're given a ticket, and that ticket basically is a revocable license, and it gives you permission to be on those premises for the event. If you violate the terms of the ticket license, and they're in the fine print, one of those – one of those violations being that you're disturbing the peace, then they can ask you to leave. And if you don't leave, then automatically you're trespassing, and they can remove you as long as they use reasonable means to do it. So the argument there is going to be Oakley saying it was unreasonable for them to basically tackle him to the ground, uh, restrain him, drag him out of there, and then hold him until the police came to get him. And they're going to say, no, that was reasonable because he you know, threw some punches and was pushing people's hands away and was acting belligerent. Oh, my gosh, the whole thing is like a soap opera, which actually is fitting, considering it is the New York Knicks organization. (laughs) Amy, I'm not sure what we ever did before we had you as our CBS Sports Radio legal analyst. Be sure to follow her on Twitter at Amy-TV. It's so good to catch up. I feel so much smarter. Thank you so much for your perspective. My pleasure. Take care.